Hawkeye fans, gather around. It's Tuesday. It's that time, 4.30 Central Time and uh, 5.30 Eastern. And our 36th edition of Hawkeyes Live here at the Voice of College Football with spring practice, of course, still in session in the spring game a few weeks away. Corey Brada makes this all work from the Hawkeye of the Storm is his platform. So please head on over there. Corey, how are you doing today? Doing good, and I want to apologize to all the listeners that we kept waiting for a few extra minutes. You and I both had problems, so, <laughs> you know, I guess those landed in the same week. It's better than, you know, you having a problem this week, and I have a problem next week, so we're late both weeks. So, uh, But I'm excited to talk linebackers, excited to talk about Iowa's latest commitment. I did post some content on uh, John Nestor's commitment to my channel here earlier today. Um, so, yeah, let's let's get down to it, Mark. So, yeah, head on over to From the Hawkeye of the Storm. Check out uh, Corey's take on John Nestor out of Chicago. You know, this linebacking position, if we want to start there, and, of course, we encourage everybody to do uh, what you do each and every week, leave your comments and your questions there in the live chat, and we will get to them. I'm looking at Pro Football Focus's rankings of returning linebackers in college football. They have both Justin Jacobs and Jack Campbell listed as 10 of the best uh, returning linebackers in the country. So it's a, a stout position for the Hawkeyes. We've, we've weaved through the offense and started with the defense and a lot of question marks at places like offensive line and wide receiver. But um, this linebacking core, at least that, that first level, seems to be pretty well set. And Mark, to be quite honest... Um, I would probably sub out Justin Jacobs for Seth Benson. I mean, I know I, that's quite frankly, that's a bit disrespectful to Seth Benson because he, I don't know the number of, maybe you can pull this up as I'm breaking this down, Mark, but I'd like to know the number of snaps for each of those guys last year. I would guess that Seth Benson had probably close to double. Maybe that's a bit egregious, um, but he probably had significantly more snaps because you got to remember, um, Dane Belton played a lot last year. And so that at times meant Justin Jacobs was riding the sidelines. Um, and I do like what Phil Parker did last year with the offense because you had flexibility and they're going to have flexibility moving forward despite losing Belton. I don't know how much they're going to play the true cash, but they've got Xavier Wampa, five-star kid who's enrolled early. He figures to factor in whether that be at safety or at cash. You've got Sebastian Castro listed as the cash. Um, but Justin Jacobs, I mean, obviously pro football focus is high on him. And you know how I feel about pro football focus, Mark. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, Corey, this would be not the first time that you disagreed with pro football focus. <laughs> I believe they had Iowa's offensive line rated in the top five nationally last year, Mark. So Now, was that leading into the season or was no, that no. at the conclusion? That was, I believe, well, it might have been mid-season, but it was, I think it was towards yeah. the conclusion. I think it was in November. Um, they, they missed the Wisconsin game, the Purdue yeah. game. They, they just missed a few games. Basically possibly. missed every game, Mark. They didn't run the, run the ball well. Maybe against Kentucky, you can argue they ran the ball, albeit versus a depleted Wildcats defense. I mean, I think that's that's fair to bring that up. So um, as I see the Durrell, Hay uh, Durrell Hayden, Durrell Hayden, I'm sorry, H Hayden, the real Hayden. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my I know man. where that's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we've got our real MVP, of course. Who's yes, we do. Uh, Hayden, he's right. The linebacker position is the least uh, uh, concerning, and I'm not concerned about any of these positions defensively, Mark. Um, defensive line is probably my biggest position of concern, but again, the depth they've got there. I saw Chad Lice to go up the Des Moines Register tweeted out today that uh, <laughs> Noah Shannon, uh, Iowa starting tackle, described Lucas Van Ness as Hercules says he looks like Hercules in practice so that'll get that'll tickle the ears of the Iowa fans out there but uh no linebacker is a very safe spot now injuries happen Mark and Iowa still runs their base defense is still the four three so you're going to see three linebackers out there a lot you may see three linebackers out there more than ever before at least in the past four or five years Mark because since they went to cash they've had superstars at that cash position whether that be Amani Hooker or, uh, you know, Geno Stone sometimes slid down there. And, of course, Dane Belton. So they don't necessarily have that guy developed yet. Now, maybe Sebastian Castro will be that guy. But I know they really like Justin Jacobs. So you're going to see a lot of three linebacker sets. Now, if Seth uh, Campbell were to, or Seth Benson were to go down or Jack Campbell were to go down, do you slide Justin Jacobs over and then perhaps move your cash and, and play more cash? That's a possibility, I would think. 
Um, but uh, yeah, those three guys, I thought Seth Benson was absolutely phenomenal last year um, in a lot of different facets of the game. And, and he's kind of the one guy who is overlooked. Jack Campbell is the big kind of physical specimen. He's just a, he's just a big, big guy. Um, just Jacobs. It was a highly recruited kid who's athletic and Seth Benson's the, you know, like, I think he's for what Sioux city. Uh, he's a small town, Iowa kid. And just one of your classic underrated guys who will probably end up playing on Sundays. So, uh, your top three are clear. They do need to develop depth. Um, you know, I'm looking up and down the roster and Zach tweet, a kid from here in story County, he's on the roster. Um, Justice Sullivan, he's another guy who at one point was actually here in Story County as well. So a couple local kids that, uh, you know, they need to take a step. I mean, uh, Jay Higgins is another guy. Um, now, Sullivan, in his defense, he's a freshman. Um, Tweet was a freshman. So you hope that another spring for those guys gets them ready. And um, one note, I know we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when the initial spring depth charts came out, but Mike Tim switched from linebacker to fullback. So there's one less guy there. They do bring in um, a couple guys from the 22 class. Jaden Montgomery is a true linebacker. Landon Van Kiekerix is an interesting one. I know uh, he's projected, I think, more at line at, at linebacker, but I could see him being your Joe Evans type of a pass rusher. I don't know what I'll be the first to admit. I don't know a ton about Landon Van Kiekerix. He was like, I think, the latest or one of the latest. He committed on signing day. And just wasn't very very highly touted. Might have been a, a zero star guy according to uh, some of these uh, recruiting sites. But they'll they'll groom him. I mean, linebacker is kind of like defensive back at Iowa. Nobody really expected Seth Benson or, or Jack Campbell to emerge as stars, and they have. Um, and then they've recruited well with with guys like Sullivan, guys like Justin Jacobs. So that, that I think right now this this spring is developing depth. Um, I, I know a lot of guys were sitting out as of last week. I don't know if that's precautionary, if they're dinged up, or what the case may be, but that's an opportunity for these younger guys to get some run. Corey, of course, you're a big fan of Phil Parker, and rightfully so. When you look at the three levels of the defense and how consistently good upper echelon in the Big Ten all three levels typically are, you know, what other credit needs to be given to position coaches, which obviously have both the, you know, kind of have a hand in three, what I would consider to be three aspects. Uh, Of course, the recruiting and the development of the individual players, but then also having a hand in the scheme and determining, you know, how the three levels are going to work together. Um, You know, those position coaches under Phil Parker, what's been the continuity there? Well, Seth Wallace has been, I mean, he's kind of been the guy that I think a lot of people, you know, two years ago, I think at this time, two years ago, people kind of looked at him as being the incumbent defensive coordinator, I think. I mean, maybe that's going a bit far. I don't know how close Phil Parker is to retiring. And Andrew, thank you for this. He, he corrected me. Seth Benson is from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I, I just got Sioux City and Sioux Falls mixed up, but he's a Midwest guy. Um, Seth Wallace has been labeled as as such for for years and he's done a tremendous job on the recruiting trail right now he is coaching linebackers and he's considered uh the assistant defensive coordinator they all they've also got jay neiman on on board he's a uh, defensive recruiting coordinator and then he assists on the defensive line but you gotta remember his two kids were also exceptional linebackers at iowa so they got a lot of expertise there and i'm sure phil parker knows a little something about <laughs> linebackers as well um now i don't mean to segue to something totally different but Seth uh, Seth Wallace did have the situation that came up during 2020 during some of the offseason turmoil where he was accused of basically making fun of Jack Kallenberger uh, for being dyslexic and so that was a problem and he kept his job um, but you know kind of like Brian Ferentz Mark and there is a difference I guess Brian Ferentz is Kirk's son but he really hasn't done a whole lot to prove himself as an, as an offensive coordinator. Seth Wallace is not Kirk's son, but he has done something to prove himself as a defensive coach. Both guys have problems though, because they're both they're, they've both been named in some serious accusations. Um, some racial, some not. I mean, Mark Kallenberg is a white guy and uh, there was, those are some pretty disturbing things that came out. And 
you know, as you know, Mark, right or wrong, time kind of heals these things. But I wonder what Seth Wallace's trajectory is. My guess is Seth will end up being a coordinator somewhere. I don't know how long I will be able to retain him. Um, we're two years removed from those allegations, and we know Jack Kallenberger is long gone. Mark Kallenberger walked away a year early. I'm guessing, and I don't want to assume, but I'm guessing maybe that had something to do with it. And uh, But, no, you're right. As far as football is concerned, they've got lots of continuity at linebacker, uh, at defensive line, and I think that's helped. Um, really just no real gaping holes um, since maybe 2000. I'm trying to think the last time Iowa struggled at the linebacker position. I want to say 2014. If I recall, 2014 was a struggle. That was Reggie Spearman and Quentin Alston. Am I getting that name right? Um, guys who weren't here very long. Um, and they struggled. I remember game, I think it was game one against Northern Iowa. They got absolutely torched by a guy nobody had heard of for you and I. His name was David Johnson. <laughs> and then he goes on to be a star in the NFL. But at the time, it just looked ridiculous. But Iowa's linebacker struggled that year. But since then, Mark, think about the guys that Iowa has produced at linebacker. Um, you know, I'm going to argue for Iowa in the DBU conversation, but think about linebacker with Josie Jewell. And, you know, obviously Bo Bauer is not really stuck in the league. Boy, he was great in college. You think of Ben Neiman, you think of Nick Neiman. Um, you can get down the list. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of other guys. So, And then even before, like 2013, think about the guys that came out of that 2013 team, Anthony Hitchens. Uh, Christian Kirksey, those guys have become stars in the NFL. So, um, no, it's it's been great. The continuity, they've been able to hold on to these guys, these coaches, for enough time to create a pretty stable uh, group of uh, linebackers year in and year out. These tackle numbers at the top of the board here with Campbell and Benson as well, it obviously speaks to their ability. 140 and 105 tackles. So if you go across the country and look at tackle figures in college football, and I look at this stuff every day, having conversations with guys like you, you know, today was Auburn, Georgia, Tennessee, Clemson. So a handful of teams every day, I'm looking at these numbers and you rarely see this at the top of a stats board. Uh, and it's got to speak again to their ability, but also uh, possibly to the flow of the defense and Phil Parker being kind of an old school guy that we funnel things to our linebackers and let them uh, clean everything up. Is there a, an argument to be made that perhaps that means a bit of underperformance from your line? Is there an argument to be made there, you think, Mark? I think the hmm, – it's possible. You could look at um, tackles for loss to see if you're getting – and this would be a rough measurement, but to see if you're getting much out of the defensive line compared to your average squad, and, and we don't – want to compare Iowa to the average defense in college football because they're way above that um, to, to see if that line is either again by design holding up blocks and allowing the linebackers to clean things up or if because the defensive line is not um, getting its its fair share of tackles and, and, and tackles behind the line as well. Um, yeah, I don't know how those metrics would would fare, but obviously Iowa doesn't give up a whole lot of yardage or series, so the less opportunity to mount tackles. So I, so I, I, I would be confident in saying Iowa would be less than the average team in the nation in regards to number of tackles because they're off the field. They get right. off the field, and Campbell and Benson have a – 245. Well, I'll just say this. and I wouldn't have brought that up in the Josie Jewell year or the, um, you know, the. I mean, you can go back, even again, back yeah. to 2013 and, and beyond. But we have to admit that the line was the, the biggest struggle last year, if there was any. I mean, they just had problems consistently getting a pass rush. So that there is room for improvement for that stellar de defensive squad. I mean, they lose Zach Van Valkenburg, who was by far their best pass rusher. Um, they get Joe Evans back. Is he an every down guy? I don't know. I know we've already talked defensive line. I don't want to rehash all that, Mark. But I guess my point is that defensive line, if if that defensive line can step up even more, I mean, it, you're you're looking at a pretty looking at a pretty staunch front seven there. I mean, 
I, I just think it, the, the line can really help this linebacking crew. And because um, again, more hits, the more tackles, the, the greater risk. One of these, one of these guys gets hurt. And I will admit this, Jack Campbell has been one of the more durable guys that we've seen at that position. He just really hasn't gotten dinged up that often. Um, do you have the numbers in front of you for Justin Jacobs in comparison to Seth and, and Jack? I do. My screen went to sleep. Uh, Justin Jacobs, 53 tackles. I don't have the snaps in front of me. So 53 tackles. And and what was Seth Benson at? How many tackles? 105. So 105. And Pro Football Focus is is saying that Justin Jacobs is – you see what my point here. I mean, I know tackles isn't – the only it's way to not everything, it. but it's a strong indicator. And in addition to this, uh, disruptive plays, Benson, five and a half tackles for loss, two sacks, Jacobs, a half a tackle for loss. So you're looking at seven and a half disruptive plays versus a half a disruptive play for Jacobs, plus toss in a pick for uh, Seth Benson. Oh, yeah, they, both, they both had an interception. Yeah, I believe Jacobs had one against Penn State. The, the bottom line is both those guys are, are have a lot of upside. Uh, Benson has been a tremendous pass rusher, um, and that really helped too. That's what they did. That's what, what makes Phil Parker kind of the magician with all this. Is he, Even when they've struggled with pass rush, um, they've been able to use stunt action. They've been able to bring blitzes, which Phil Parker's never been a big blitz guy, but they he does it at the right time. The timing seems to almost always be right. And so they were able to get away with an underperforming defensive line. So, um, you know, again, defensively, they stopped the run nicely last year. A big part of that was linebackers. But the the line does share a responsibility there. And I, I, I do think as that line improves, it takes more pressure off Campbell and Benson specifically. Um, I will be interested to see, I've been going back to the cash conversation, who emerges there and then... I mean, I just want, I'm kind of curious to see how the, um, I don't know, the pecking order, it, it, because you, you've got Sebastian Castro listed right now as the starting cash. Nobody's talking about him, and that's fine. I think if you're Sebastian Castro, you're, you're fine with that. Um, but if it's Wampa, if it's, if it's Castro, you probably run, if you're comfortable with Quinn Schulte or Wampa plus Merriweather at safety, then you probably run Castro at cash only. I guess maybe uh, are they comfortable doing that or they, they, you know, and give him maybe 25% of snaps if they're in the four, three, you know, the other 75% of the time. But if you have Wampa there, you're not going to take Wampa off the field 75% of the time, Mark. So it will just be interesting to see how this shakes out. I mean, there's going to be some position battles, but I'm guessing that schematically a lot of this is going to be decided in the summer and in fall camp because they got to figure out who, what the pecking order is with the secondary and with linebackers before they make any decisions. Corey and myself here every uh, Tuesday at four 30 central time for Iowa Hawkeyes live. We've done it 36 consecutive weeks, head on over to from the Hawkeye of the storm uh, as Corey has wrapped up the basketball coverage there and uh, continues with football and a commit for the Hawkeyes today and the, defensive secondary out of Chicago and Jack Nestor. And, you know, this, this is a better question for once we get to the secondary comment uh, uh, analysis that will bring everyone probably next week. Um, but I'm going to spit it out anyway, because I may not think of it next week. When was the last time that there was this type of hype expectation, excitement surrounding a defensive freshman coming to campus, uh, for the first time as Xavier Wampa? That's a great question. Um, I, I will say this. Um, Desmond King was a very, uh, not a very highly touted kid. Let's just say that. Uh, I don't remember Josh Jackson, how highly recruited he was. Matt Hankins was a decently recruited kid. Dallas Cradith was a pretty high, he was a four-star kid that hasn't seen the field much. But yeah, I mean, five-star defensive backs, you just don't see coming to Iowa very often. So you're right. I mean, it, the, the expectations are sky high. Um, I don't think there's I, – I will be shocked, and I mean this. I will be shocked if Kirk Ferentz doesn't find playing time for Xavier Wampa immediately. Um, I just I, – I cannot imagine a scenario where you don't get him on the field. Um, he's that dynamic enough, and, and all the reports out of camp so far, Mark, are that he's lived up to the hype. Um, you know, we got a sneak preview of him in the 
what was it the All American Bowl back in uh, what January, and I thought he I thought he showed out and looked really good in that game as did Aaron Graves who's not enrolling early, but you're right. I mean it's a, it's an opportunity and he could play again. He could play safety. He could be at cash. Um, I I just I can't imagine a scenario where he's just special teams year one. Um, and you know we've heard great things out of camp. I've heard great things out of camp about T.J. Hall. Um, he, he's another guy who enrolled early as a defensive back. I mean, you, you might have to get him on the field, Mark. He's a Fres- uh, Fresno guy. I mean, Iowa doesn't get a lot of California kids typically, but we know the connection with Don Patterson and, and his TJ's dad, Terrence playing for Don. And, and that's, it's a huge get because maybe it opens up, you know, if he has some, some early success, it opens up a, a small pipeline out there. I mean, I don't know how much Iowa really wants to work that area in general, but, um, yeah, I mean, T.J. Hall's got size. He's got length. So you're right. Uh, Xavier Wampa's the guy. But I said it in the video I did today on John Nestor, Mark, that this is about as well as Iowa has recruited at defensive back since Kirk Ferentz has been here. Prove me wrong. I mean, Jordan Bernstein, I guess you could bring him up if you want. And he was, a, I think, a five-star kid by some by some sites. But I, I just I, – I don't remember this many guys. And you got Deshaun Harris – Deshaun Lee, excuse me. Coming in next year, John Nestor coming in next year. You've also got Cohen and Tringer, Orlando Trader, um, and then a couple of young guys who haven't seen the field uh, yet either. So uh, you're right. Uh, Wampa's uh, all he's cut out to be. And I think the good news is that he's got plenty of young talent around him to push him and make him that much better. I have kept the comment uh, from the real MVP up on the screen just to take note that uh, I saw on Twitter yesterday that 247 Sports, I just saw the post, which just included the New Year's Six, which the representation from the Big Ten was Ohio State in the college football playoff, their bowl projections, Michigan in the Rose Bowl, and Wisconsin making a New Year's Six game. So... Corey, I know that you weren't overly excited about the assignment to the Citrus Bowl, which after the New Year's Six is arguably, and I think most people would agree, to be the next bowl in line after the New Year's Six. But if 247 Sports is on the money here, uh, a, a vacation during the holidays to Nashville and the Music City Bowl, I got to think, would not sit too well with you. Well, yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Obviously, that means that this season was probably not a 10-win season. Now, That's I've a all... seven and five forecast, pretty much. Yeah. Something in that range. Uh, I know a lot of fans who would actually like to go to this game, Mark, if it's in Nashville, because that's kind of the one place Iowa fans haven't been able to go to. And Nashville's a cool city. Sure. Um, remember, yeah. they were scheduled to go there in 2020, and their game against Missouri was canceled due to COVID within the Tigers program. So, um, no, I, I wouldn't – from a – vacation standpoint i don't know if, I don't know if i'd go down there or not but it's not a terrible location but yeah you're you're right it means a, probably a seven win season maybe eight you you and i both know that i have no problem projecting iowa to win seven or eight games and it's not be being a hater i just being realistic so that doesn't necessarily su- surprise me um now Ar- playing arkansas mark what's where, where do you have arkansas this this coming year have you looked at their schedule uh well, they have their typically difficult SEC Western Division slate. They play BYU out of conference, and I think that's their their one difficult non-conference game. I don't think they have another. No, they're SEC. They, why would they schedule another one? There's a few there that uh, <laughs> let's uh, don't don't force me to to bring the facts out oh, here. Oh, three okay. three gimmies plus a hard one, Mark. That's right. Isn't that what it is usually? Well, what does Iowa schedule? You, we we got nine know. conference games, Mark, and then you got a game against Iowa State. It's, games. it's one tough non-conference game and two gimmies. It's not three. You know, I'm just saying, and maybe they'll go back to it. I know there's been talk about the Big Ten going back to a, an eight-game conference season. What are Arkansas? Pull up Arkansas's. If I weren't maimed here, I would pull it up. But pull up Arkansas's schedule, Mark. Let's understand: Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, South Carolina. Four teams in the SEC always play an ACC rival counterpart. South Carolina plays Clemson. Kentucky plays sure. Louisville, Georgia, Georgia Tech, Florida, Florida State. So then they typically tack on another one. For example, Florida plays Florida State. They also play Utah. Okay, well, that's that's an exception, Mark. 
Georgia, Georgia Tech, but they also play Oregon. Well, Kentucky did not do that last Kentucky year. Kentucky doesn't do that. They don't yeah. do that. No. Yeah. Daryl MVP, uh, he's here. He's our Kentucky fan. You, you and I both know they don't do what they played Chattanooga and the real MVP and I had this discussion just the other day, and I told him, I bet I will not be able to find a Kentucky opponent in the Power Five other than Louisville. I'll have to go back to Indiana because, believe it or not, this is maybe slightly before your time, and I know you're not focused on Indiana football, but that used to be a yearly rivalry. Kentucky and Indiana would play in football every year, but I had to go back to like 04, 05 that Kentucky played anybody else outside of conference, but, and, and you know, my issue with Iowa and Iowa state. No, I don't. I really don't. What's your issue with Iowa, Iowa state. Well, my, my issue is not that the game's played because it's a tremendous rivalry that, that's needed in college football. It's that I, I have this set statement that I make every year that Iowa state has the most boring schedule in college football, Iowa state, because their conference schedule is set. Everybody plays everyone, so you know exactly true. who they're playing. They're playing Very everyone. True. And then they always play Iowa. I've never thought so about gonna, that, Mark. They're going to play two other scrubs. I've never thought about that. Yes. So their fans have no anticipation of what the well, schedule is going to be. Iowa's a bit different because right. you're in the Big Ten. So I mean, Yeah, it's a little different in that they could be playing Ohio State. They could be playing Penn State. They could be playing whomever from the Eastern Division. But in terms of what Iowa can control, that's the out-of-conference schedule, of course. And who do they play? Iowa State. Who else do they play? No yeah. one. <laughs> well, but again, yeah, I understand. But I understand what you're saying. For, so from a from a boring to exciting standpoint, yes, I, I get what you're saying. But it's no comparison to what Kentucky does. They've got they're in the same situation conference wise as Iowa, except they play one less game, and then they yeah. schedule three cupcakes on top of a built in Louisville game. Okay, it's 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 one more cupcake than Iowa. Right. Yeah. Right. And an opportunity. Iowa doesn't really have an opportunity. They can't go schedule somebody else, Mark. They can't well, go schedule somebody else. I understand. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I understand they're in a predicament. They have to play Iowa State. The, you know, the game needs to be played. Uh, but it's just, you know, there's, there's no anticipation. You know, yes. pick, your, pick your team. And I can tell you that Oregon fans are excited. They're playing Georgia this year. Uh, and, and just just pick your team. Ohio State's playing Notre Dame this year. Um, but Iowa, when's the last time they played Pitt? I think Pitt was the last out-of-conference opponent. That's because then they switched to nine, the nine-game conference schedule. I just What I have a problem with is, and I'm not saying you've done this, but you know Colin Cowherd has done this. When people attack Iowa's schedule because they, they play nobody besides Iowa State in non-conference, and then they, they bring up, well, look at Alabama. They played LSU and they played Notre Dame or whatever. Again, these are apples to oranges. You're looking at an eight-game conference schedule to a nine-game conference schedule, and we're not taking into account that that ninth game is the equivalent to scheduling an, a, a, a second Power 5 non-conference opponent. It, hmm. it really is. I mean, it's, you could argue it's better because the Big, Ten, you know, the Big Ten is probably the best conference in the country, depending on who the crossover is. The who? Who's the best conference in the country? One, I didn't say. I did not say they are the big, the best team in the. Uh, the uh, hey, what was it? <laughs> Here we go down this road. We're really going down rabbit holes today, Mark. <laughs> One of the best conferences in the country, yes. perhaps, Wonderful. perhaps the best. Could the argument be made? Could it be made? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would like to make it. I wish it wasn't so cut and dry. I would like to be able to have those debates, but it's just not debatable right I, I let me let me eat my words on something drill mvp says in our chat that arkansas plays cincinnati and byu those are two oh, cincinnati yes. those are two really tough games when you asked me that i knew there was another one i was searching for it yes yeah, yeah i mean i know i give them credit if they're doing that but i'm not going to give them more credit than i than for I, okay so again arkansas plays in the, the sec west so that's the toughest division in college football i get yes. that so that in and of itself makes it a tougher schedule all right uh now kentucky they have they play in the weaker of the two SEC yes. con, uh, divisions, sure. and they still refuse to schedule non-conference. So I do have respect for what Arkansas has done. All I'm saying is, do you just say, well, Arkansas has been a, a you know a star as it relates to conference scheduling? They still play eight conference games with two tough 
non-conference games. Iowa plays nine conference games with one tough non-conference game. And you cannot say that Iowa State's not tough. That's a, it's Now that's become a tough game every year. But the SEC Western Division is the toughest division. Right. right. And, no. and there are no cupcakes in that. There's no Northwestern of two of the last three years. There's no Illinois in that debate. There's nothing but quality teams. There's nothing but top 35 teams in that division. It's loaded. Hey, uh, Ferris just commented. He said Big Ten is 100% the best conference. Ferris, I wish I could agree with you. I love you, Ferris, But whoever you are. I, but I watch college football, actually. So, <laughs> Ferris... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Ferris. We love you being here. You're a great supporter of the channels. Uh, but there's there's it's just not even debatable between the Big Ten and the SEC. And I wish it was. I wish it was. I would love to go on a rampage and produce a video tomorrow that says Big Ten is the best conference in college football. Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> OK, that went right over your head, Mark. Uh, yeah, so here's the deal. Was that a Ferris Bueller? Ferris Bueller reference. Um, okay. Here's the deal. As it relates to the SEC, I understand it's a better conference, but when people get on Iowa and get on Kirk, this is something I will defend Kirk on because people have gotten on Kirk about scheduling. If, the, if what we're going to fall back on is, well, the SEC West is much tougher than the Big Ten West. That's fine, but that's not Kirk's fault. He can't no, control no, no, that. No. And Iowa can't I'm control not blaming that. Iowa. I'm just saying it's the most boring outside of Iowa State the most boring schedule in the country each year because they're locked into a situation in which they're not going to go out and schedule. They, they could get USC goes out and schedules two difficult non-conference games and play a nine game conference season. They do that routinely. They play in the PAC 12 Mark. We're going to bring that up. Come on now. Come on now. Well, yeah. If you're taking conference, well, shouldn't we? If we're talking about, they, well, well, then they, if you play in the SEC West, they could say, you know what, we play in the SEC West. We're so, not going to play anybody out of conference. Well, but I'm just saying we're, we're going to compare the what, what was the conference of the eight? What was the conference that was actually performed better uh, versus other Power Five conferences? Was it the Mountain West? The Mountain West that? was better than the Pac-12. In the Pac-12, so he argued. And does the Mountain West play eight or nine conference games? Eight. Okay. So I guess that you can't really bring them up. But I, I guess my point is, yeah, USC does it, and USC is USC. I'm not saying that I, you know Iowa fans should settle, but, I mean, USC is, you know. <laughs> you, you talk about being locked into a game. They play Notre Dame non-conference every year, USC, but then they'll go out and schedule Alabama. They had Alabama and Notre Dame a couple of years ago yeah. non-conference. Yeah, anyway. I mean, it's not will, will they keep it's doing not, that? It's not a knock against Iowa. They're just locked into a situation, and I don't like it because I think we could have an interesting conversation during the offseason if we said, man, Iowa's playing Texas this year. They're playing Stanford this year. I'd love that. I'd love that. And you know what that what what may happen if the Big Ten goes back to eight games? Have you heard rumblings of that happening, Mark? Uh rumblings, yes. I mean, how, I mean, that, but that's probably years down the road, correct? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Can I just go off on a rant about something for a second? Sure. Why is it that every rant. time change needs to occur in college football, <laughs> it takes freaking years to change? Explain that to me, Mark. Why does it take years? <laughs> I know you there's know, contracts and whatnot. Come on. You know what's ironic is I know you're not a baseball guy, but when Major League Baseball decides to make a change, and ba Major League Baseball is a dinosaur otherwise, they change things and they, they get it implemented like in three weeks. I know. But yeah. yes, in college football, it... Well, it you, or you could bring up the NBA. People have their problems with the NBA for whatever reasons. They did this play-in game or these play-in games, I should say, for the playoffs. So the, basically you have 10 teams as opposed to eight from each conference. You have 10 yeah. teams that have a shot. And they did it during the bubble, and they just said, we're going to stick with it. We're not going to – well, we're implementing 2025. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just so ridiculous. I just – I get so sick of the playoff expansion talks. Explain the, expand the freaking playoff, Mark. Yeah. What What are we doing here? And yet it continues to be a conversation – you know, the whole conference, I, I get I, to me, it doesn't even it loses interest for me when I hear about these changes. But, oh, if they happen, they're not if they happen, they're not going to occur for another three years. So 
I do have a problem with that. And yes, I know the schedules are set years in advance. That's probably part of the problem, but um, yeah. maybe that should change because that, that does cause problems. Mark, you have games scheduled against teams that were perceived to be a certain at a certain level and now they're not. And it hurt. I mean, that does, you can't not do that. Everybody has to schedule years in advance. So you, you can, it's hard to blame. Say Kirk Ferentz went out and scheduled Cincinnati for, they're a good example, right? They're a power right now, but they're not always a power mark. And there have been years where they've not been very good. So you schedule Cincinnati now for 2025 and 2025 rolls around and they're garbage. And then you're going to be saying, well, that's a crap. That's a, you know, if they go back to eight games and they play two and it's Iowa state and Cincinnati, people are going to be like, that's, that's a terrible non-conference schedule. So that's yeah. a, there's a lot of problems. This is deeper than just what we're talking about. And there's only a handful of programs that you can be almost a hundred percent ironclad confident that they're going to be right. good in 10 years. I mean, USC, um, USC wouldn't even fall into that. No, you just brought they were awful last year. Awful. They were Illinois last year. Um, Mike 3883, I don't know where you're going with this. We appreciate you being here, Mike. Uh, another faithful viewer to all the channels. But uh, yes, uh, the SEC West is the best division. Well, I think he's saying that the Big Ten East is better. Is that what he's saying? No. I mean, is that what he's saying, though? I mean, you may not agree with it, but is that what is that what you're saying, Mark? Or Mike? Again, Mike? It's it's one thing when I when I come across uh, a, an opinion and I can say that's that's I don't agree with that opinion, but we can have a conversation because that's a valid logical statement to make. That's not. Well, here's the deal. It's not even. We've had these conversations, Mark, but can we both agree that there are multiple ways to examine which one's the tougher division or which one's the best? Like, I'll give you a perfect example. You look at the Big Ten in general. And you can say, well, I'm going to compare it to the Big 12. Even in basketball, you may have two to three teams at the bottom that are garbage, but they're not apples to apples because you've got the Big 12 with less teams. You've got the Big 10 that might be more balanced throughout. The Big 12 may be t more top heavy. So, what are we, what's the criteria here? I well, think it depends. This is an apples to apples. It's a seven team versus seven team. There is no Rutgers in the SEC Western Division. There's nothing close to Rutgers. There's nothing close to what Indiana was last year, which was a bad, bad football team. There's nothing close to Maryland. Every team in the SEC West is leaps and bounds better than Maryland. So who are the top three teams in the SEC West, Mark? Alabama. They're pretty good, I think. Eh, they've had their moments. They, they had an off <laughs> year, and they came within three minutes of winning the national championship. Who, who are the top three teams? Texas you know, a Right, and where did AM and m finish just on the outside of the playoff, right? Uh, no, they went 8-4 and four last year. Wh who am I thinking of that finished on the outside of the playoff? And then I guess we would go with Ole Miss. They Ole Miss, they finished. Bowl. They weren't far from the playoff. They were 10-2 and two regular season team. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they were like that's seven, what I was thinking. Eight. I, guess, I guess my point is, Mark, uh, Mike might be looking at it and saying, well, Michigan made the playoff, and Ohio State might have been the best team that didn't make the playoff, Right. We made that argument, and so probably you're looking at it from top to bottom. But if we're looking at it from the very, very top, I know that Alabama. I get it. I, yell, <laughs> I get it, who Alabama is, but I'm just saying those top. Two, you could say the top two from the big. Can we agree cumulatively? Well, mate, you're not going to agree with this, but cumulatively, the top two from the bi the Big Ten East are better than the top two from the SEC West. No, that argument can't be I made. I wish they were. Alabama played a split versus the team that annihilated Michigan. There's I understand. There's, it's just, yeah, I understand. Uh, okay. So here's the deal. I just want to bring this up one, one more thing and then we can get back to Iowa specifically, but Penn state was a disappointment. Yes. Had Penn state been a nine to 10 win team, that conversation would have come more in play. Correct. Cause Maryland wasn't bad. I mean, Maryland was not bad. They, Maryland no, they went seven and six, but they're not as good as the worst team in the SEC West. Who's the worst team in the SEC West, and what was their record last it was year? Probably seven and six, Mississippi State. That was the worst okay. record. And Rutgers was five and, and seven. Mississippi State's leaps and bounds better than Maryland. Mississippi State's not losing to Ohio State by fifty points. Maryland, Maryland lost to Iowa by what thirty four point thirty seven points. Mississippi State's not doing that. So Rutgers made a, Rutgers played in a bowl game. Anybody. Rutgers played in a bowl game, Mark. Yeah, there were no extenuating circumstances, of course, <laughs> involving okay. 
that situation. Oh, uh, I love having these debates with you because you know I don't I I don't really I'm not saying I agree with with Mike. I'm just kind of giving you devil's advocate on this. But uh, no, I I agree. The SEC. I do think. Can we agree that is the is the Big Ten West? This is going to be an interesting one. Is the Big Ten West better than the SEC East? That's a tough one because the Big Ten West is more balanced. Can we agree yeah, with that? Absolutely, it is. This is a this is a conversation. So you need to do video. You need to do content. SEC East versus, or excuse me, SEC West versus Big Ten East, and then vice versa. This is great. This is great commentary. That that's uh, the 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 Big Ten West is deeper not by much the florida's a, florida was a disaster I, mean, I shouldn't say a disaster you're gonna say well they were six and six they were not good they yeah. had to change coaches vanderbilt's a disaster every the, year the sec's disasters are relative to how good those teams usually are vanderbilt no not van vanderbilt aside okay but they have to be included if yeah, they have to be included but are they much worse than northwestern as a program? What? No, 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 not as a program. We're talking. I'm talking about the here and now. Sure. What we watched last season. I mean, that's all. That's all. The rest was awful. I, they were awful too. But Mark Vanderbilt, who did they? Uh, what was? <laughs> what was Vanderbilt? Let me let me, let me pull up Vanderbilt's they, they schedule. Two and ten. They lost every SEC game. Okay, they lost every. Oh, I want to know who their two wins were against because they. But beat- other than Vandy. Everybody from the division went to a bowl game. I, okay, that's fine. And so Minnesota went to a bowl game. Iowa went to a bowl game. Wisconsin went to a bowl game. So ne- Nebraska's holding the Big Ten West down because if Nebraska was decent, then the conversation you, you could throw – because Illinois was – what, Illinois went 5-7? and seven? Yeah. So they're better than Vanderbilt. Right. Oh, oh, sure. Everybody's a, better than Vanderbilt. As a program, Northwestern's better than Vanderbilt. Absolutely. I would even say Nebraska is substantially better than Vanderbilt Absolutely. as a program, even Absolutely. if they're not winning. Vanderbilt's off the, the board. <laughs> they have to be included, though. They have to be included. Yes. Yeah. They lost to Eastern Tennessee State. I see that from drilling. But on the me. flip side, on the other end of the spectrum, at the top of the list, Georgia's so far beyond anything. <laughs> Yeah, in the SEC West, in the Big Ten West. So, so Wisconsin, Georgia, you don't think that'd be a game in a typical year? Well, I shouldn't say you're looking at just last year. Yeah, or we can talk programs, but Georgia is still a, just a just because I, I, I do believe that if Wisconsin group. played Georgia, I, I mean, this is all speculation, but I think if Wisconsin played Georgia tomorrow, I think it'd be a close game. I think Wisconsin's defense would keep them in the game. I don't, Mark, you don't think Wisconsin's defense could hold down Georgia's offense? I, I think it'd I be a low-scoring game. We saw what Georgia did to Michigan. Michigan's much better than Wisconsin. At least they were last year. They beat them by three touchdowns at Camp Randall. I think that that game is a 27-10 to 10 game. Yes, Wisconsin's defense would hold Georgia down. But Wisconsin's offense would do nothing in that game, and, and primarily why? Because they don't because have a quarterback. Georgia had the best defense in the country. Well, that's true too. But they also don't have a quarterback. You you put a you, you know it sure. comes back to the same issue with Iowa. So yeah. it's Ohio State and Georgia. Who knows? No, these are all good conversations to have. Um, I, I do want to bring up something. Well, I mentioned quarterback because we are you brought up defensive back. How we're going to talk about that next week, Mark? We already talked about defensive backs. We talked oh, about okay. defensive backs last we week. We went out of order then. Okay. So we did. We kind of that went threw all, me off. Next week, I believe our last position to preview, Mark, is quarterbacks. But I want to say this. Um, can I can I just run through a couple comments that were made sure. by Brian Ferentz this past week? Have we talked enough about linebackers? Is there anything else that we haven't? mentioned that you want to bring up we don't really talk about the young guys because they're not here yet montgomery's not here van kikerix is not here a- anything else that i'm missing there before we move on i'm just going to cap off our conversation about the sec and the big 10 and again believe me i would love to be arguing for the big 10 i have posted videos through the years touting the big 10 and so forth and so on but uh, this is just again to put it into context auburn was terrible last year yes they were terrible for auburn they went to happy valley 
and lost a nail biter to Penn State. They're terrible. <laughs> They're not terrible. They were one of the 30 best teams in the country. They were terrible. They were well. You know how I feel about Auburn. I, they, they, to me, they're the most undisciplined team in all of college football. But you're right. I mean, they're still a bowl team um, in a comp, against in, their schedule in, in, against the best team. schedule, one of the best schedules in the country. I get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, let me bring up Brian Ferentz for a second, Mark. Sure. And I'm not interested in just sitting down here ripping Brian Ferentz, but uh, if you haven't already done so, and I'll, I'll send you a link to to watch Brian Ferentz's interview. And if anybody hasn't or his press conference, if anybody here listening has not listened to Brian Ferentz's press conference, I encourage you to do that. Find the press conference from last week, dissect it, listen to it. Because I, I am not, I, I, when I go into a press conference or I'm listening to, to Kirk or whoever it may be, I'm going in, into it with open ears. And again, I, I want Brian Ferentz to succeed. I, I don't have any desire to see him fail here. But I watched the press conference with Brian Ferentz last week and I thought it was I thought it was very very alarming, to say the least. And and I know nobody else has been talking about that. I thought he looked, I thought Brian Ferentz looked very very nervous, and maybe it's because he's he's under a, a microscope more than he ever has been. To me, he looks like he's over in over his head, Mark. And every question that was asked of of Brian, he seemed to, and he even used the word. He said it at one point. He said, "I know I'm kind of filibustering," and I thought, "You've been filibustering this entire press conference." He's asked a question and he he's and he goes on these tangents and I again I it's nothing against him personally I just think he seems out of sorts, not because he's not an intelligent person, not because he's not a, a good coach in some respects, but because I don't think I think he knows that he's not qualified right now, and may, maybe he'll prove me wrong. I hope he does, but you know he was asked specifically about quarterback and I don't know wh- which reporter it was that asked him about the quarterback position mark, but it was a great question. They asked Brian, how do you view? the quarterback position. And they brought up Brad Banks. Brad Banks had like what, 500 rushing yards in 2002. And he asked Brian, he said, is that the type of stat line you want from an Iowa quarterback? Is that kind of how you view the the ideal situation at that position? And how do you think he answered Mark? Do you want to take a guess in summary? Um, I, um, as soon as you asked that question, a certain politician came to mind, but I don't want to go in that direction. Of course, in regards to, um, meandering all over the place and really saying nothing. Um, I would say that, that he in, in, in some fashion discounted the value of getting that kind of production on the ground from a quarterback. He said, no, ideally we'd prefer not. We, we don't want a guy running all over the place. He said, that's not really the ideal. He said, we view, and he said this with a straight face, Mark. He said, we do not view we do not want the quarterback here is strictly a distributor. We want the quarterback to get the ball to our playmakers. And that's his job. And, and it was the most, and you got to listen to it, Mark, because I know I'm not get, doing it justice. It was the most baffling thing I'd ever, I, I think I'd ever heard come out of his mouth because normally Brian is pretty, I, I think he does pretty well in press conferences. He, he, he kind of self deprecates. He even used that term the other day. He, he tries to be self deprecating and, I'm not saying that's an act. Maybe that's just how he how he is. But um, yeah, he made a comment about the quarterback position and said, "We really those that's not our playmaker. We, the job of the of the quarterback is to get the ball to the playmakers." Now, just think about the, what those words what those words implicate, Mark. You're talking Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen. Think of the best quarterbacks right now. Are those guys just distributors? Or are they play? Are they playmakers? Besides my guy, yeah, they're 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 playmakers. Who's your guy? My guy in Green Bay. Oh, but uh, well, no, he's a playmaker. Yeah, he can move around. Yeah, not yeah. not like his younger days, but yeah. Uh, that aside, my style of football, what I enjoy watching, and maybe I enjoy it even more now because we don't see it, is I loved the days of Drew Bledsoe standing like a statue in the pocket and just throwing lasers all over the place. But the matter of the fact is what is enjoyed by the likes of me versus what's effective are two different things. And any defensive coordinator will tell you if you have to play defense versus 11 players versus 10 players, you're basically in a traditional offense with a quarterback. Once 
if he's not a threat, if it's a traditional quarterback, you're playing against 10 players instead of 11 versus having to account for a quarterback. That doesn't mean you want a quarterback who's a running back playing quarterback and he can't throw the ball and he can't make decisions just because he can run. You know, you talk about a stereotype from years and years and years ago is that, oh, well, if you've got a running quarterback, you obviously can't do the other things. No, we're seeing it all over college football. There are guys that can do all of those things. And the NFL. Smart decisions. They can throw accurately and they're a threat on the ground. I just, I do have a problem with 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 that. Uh, I I don't even know what it is. Philosophy. I, I don't know how that can be. A, I don't know how you can downplay your best, the best offensive year of your dad's career. Two thousand two was the best offensive year of his entire career here, Mark. And he he was asked, "Is that the ideal quarterback, or is that the ideal quarterback uh, stat line?" And his answer was, "No, we really don't want the, a guy running that much. We'd prefer him just to be a distributor." That's going to run off recruits, Mark. And that also should answer Iowa fans who are concerned, why don't we go to the portal? Why didn't they go after Jaden Delora? Why didn't they go after Jaden Daniels? Why didn't they go after Bo Nix? There's your answer. And, and, and I know there's probably several answers, but they don't want a quarterback like that, Mark. We keep sitting here thinking, well, we want this and we want that as fans. They don't want that, Mark. That's the whole problem. If you, if, if you really want to look at they do not want it. It's not that they're hesitant to do it because they're unsure if he'll succeed. They don't want it. Right or wrong. Maybe you disagree with how I feel about it. I think it's concerning. And I think it's it limits you with recruiting, not just in the transfer portal, but in general. Because why would a quarterback who is a playmaker, why would a quarterback who's a playmaker, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes-esque, why would he ever want to come here, Mark? Why would Caleb Williams ever want to come here? I mean, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Maybe it's because Paul Christ doesn't feel that way. Clearly, I mean, because they went after Caleb Williams. So obviously they, they, because Caleb Williams is a playmaker. And the percentage of quarterbacks that are coming out of the high school ranks that have that dimension to them is only increasing. It's not decreasing. Yeah. So they're going to, they're going to have a limited field of quarterbacks to choose from more and more as we go forward. And the bottom line is they recruited Carson May, who I, He's got great arm talent, but he's six foot five and he's a statue. I mean, that's what he is. That's just now he's more mobile than Spencer, I think. And Spencer made a comment this past week. He was asked specifically about his game and mobility. And he said, well, I did take off this past week in practice and I, I felt like I was going pretty fast. That's great. I hope he I hope he gets faster. I wish the best for Spencer Petrus. But I think fans need to get ready for a Spencer Petrus season, Mark. They need to get ready for that because – the comment that was made last week by Brian tells me that that's what they want. And they do believe that the offensive line, and it seems to me like, like Ken O'Keefe has been painted as the scapegoat. And you know I've been critical of Ken O'Keefe, Mark, but I by no means think that Ken O'Keefe was the only problem. I think it's disrespectful to Ken O'Keefe, who put in a lot of time for this program, and was also the offensive coordinator when Brad Banks was the quarterback here. So let's not forget that. Um, Brian also said that he doesn't know how to throw a football. And I've had people who have said to me, he doesn't need to have played quarterback. I, I, I'm not saying he has to have played quarterback, but when you're the quarterback's coach and you don't know how to throw a football, Mark, that's that's probably not good, man. That's probably not good. <laughs> can, we, can we agree on that, Mark? Come on. If you don't know, if you're you're a quarterback so, and you don't know how to throw a football, we got some problems. That's all I'm saying. And the good news is, if you're an Iowa fan, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, we talked about it last week. I've not had time to produce content on my channel or, or extra content on this channel about John Budmeyer. But Iowa does have the Colorado State quarterbacks coach slash offensive coordinator from last year working for free right now. <laughs> working for free, Mark. All right. So I, get, I guess they have somebody teaching these guys, I guess. And I guess that he can be on the field because apparently he was. That was the report that he was on the field. Last I checked, if you're an analyst, you can't be on the field. So. But anyways, that was uh, that was the report that he was out there working with quarterbacks. Uh, that was Rob Howe. I'll attribute that to him. He's the one who tweeted that out during the media availability last week. But John Budmeyer knows how to throw a football, Mark. He's a Wisconsin quarterback. He's a quarterback's coach at Wisconsin. He was a quarterback's coach slash OC at Colorado State. He knows how to throw a football. So that's positive. I still go back to the fact that 
listen, they're not going to be able, I can't imagine a scenario where John Budmeyer stays here working for more than one year. Why would you stay here working for free for it for more than a year, Mark? I don't even know why he's here now. I'll be quite honest. I think it's great that he is, but I, I don't know what, what is it doing for him? I just can't imagine that there wasn't a, a, a more lucrative offer somewhere. So I, 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 that's a question mark still, but at least they have somebody teaching the fundamentals. And it also goes back to, it almost seems to me like we're becoming more and more reliant on guys like Tony Rassiopi to coach the quarterbacks than, than we are. Because, I mean, Brian basically admitted last week that he, he doesn't really understand the fundamentals of throwing a football. But he understands schematics and things like that. I, I just, it's it's a it's it's a very sad situation. It's a very uh, uh, confounding situation. Mark, do you think your often you think your quarterbacks coach should know how to throw a football? Do you think that's a good thing to know? Or yeah, so that's that's one of the fundamental aspects of you know, go to any college football practice, uh, high school practice, but we'll keep it on the college level. Cause I used to do it on a fairly regular basis in the sec West, uh, by the way. Uh, and your the, the spring practice and the first few days of August camp are just fundamentals. That offensive line coach knowing this is what an offensive line stance looks like. This is the way the weight should be shifted. This should be the first step. It should be, that's a false step. We don't do that. That's what you do. And the throwing motion of a, of a quarterback is probably one of the more intricate examples we could give. And someone who knows what that looks like is going to be able to tell their quarterback, the ball's sailing because you're dropping your elbow or, X, Y, and Z. They could diagnose it. This is such a sad. Well, 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 this is such a sad conversation, Mark. It's such a sad conversation, Mark. I don't even know how to describe it. I know you're not an Iowa fan, so you don't understand yeah, how. So, Iowa so it's fans not are sad for me, but it's it's uh, ridiculous. It's it's we're talking about a, a top fifteen to twenty program in the country. Mark, you know, listen, we've been doing this show for, what, a month and a half since Brian Ferentz has been the quarterback. Have I come here every week and whined about it? No. No, I haven't been talking about it. No. I've been just playing out. But when I heard that last week, I'm sorry, people are going to get mad at me for bringing this up again. I don't really care because the criticism is deserved at this point. Now, they're also, you, uh, I understand the perspective of, hey, we got to wait and see what happens. Give the guy a chance. Well, some Iowa fans, I think I'm speaking for some Iowa fans, feeling like they've already given Brian Ferentz a chance to succeed with this offense, and now we're just giving him more responsibility. And I, I so I understand the frustration. I, I can relate to the frustration. With that being said, once we get to fall, I will be out there supporting Iowa, and I'll be rooting for Spencer Petras or whoever the quarterback is. But it's just so concerning and so disconcerting um, because you and I both know, Mark, for a fact – that Iowa had every opportunity to hire Randy Hedberg out of North, North Dakota State, said, nope, we're not interested. You, we assume they very well could have hired John Budmeyer, right? <laughs> you think John Budmeyer would have been the quarterback's coach if he's working for free now, Mark? What do you think? I mean, just speculating here. I would say, I would say he, prob he probably would have taken the job. I wouldn't have been upset with John Budmeyer as the quarterback's coach. Colorado State had a middle-of-the-pack offense last year. He's a former quarterback. He's a young guy. People want youth now. Instead, we've, we've got him as a volunteer. He'll probably leave. Uh, maybe he'll make it through the year. But why does he have any – I mean, he's working here. Literally, he's working here as a volunteer. That is his official title. He's a volunteer. So, anyways, um, just thought I'd bring that up. I'm going to send you, Mark, I'm going to send you a copy of Brian's press conference from last week. Again, it's nothing personal to Brian. I think he's in over his head. And – that's not all his fault. I, I mean, I, I think, I think he's kind of been placed in this position. And with that being said, he, I, I do think he, from everything I heard, he was trying to get out of here a couple months ago and he probably just couldn't find a, a landing spot. If this goes spiraling this year, he, he has to go. I mean, I'm not saying Kirk's going to fire him, but Mark, he has to go. <laughs> you, you, there is no way if there are 120 in the, or even a hundred in the country in offense, Mark, does he hang on to his job for another year? 
at some point, the big boosters are, they are, and people laugh at this too. They're going to stop giving money because it, it, it's, there's a lot of fans and, and some of the high rollers. I know there are some high rollers who are upset, maybe not enough to make change right now, but I think a lot of them are probably in the wait and see approach. But I think one more bad year, there's, there's, as Ferris says in the chat, accountability. And I don't think a lot of fans feel like there's a lot of accountability right now. And it's, yeah, it makes it more difficult when it's your son. But, you know, like it's not, well, I didn't, you know, I hired this guy based off purely off a of resume. I didn't know he was my son. Now I've got a difficult situation. Kirk knew this going in and they've decided to continue to press forward. Kirk has done, essentially, he's just doubled down. Right, Mark? All the criticism in the offseason, you know, the the calls for Brian to leave and whatever else. And he said, not only are we not going to get rid of him as the offensive coordinator, we're going to promote him. And Mark, Chuck Long, I told you, I think I told you this last week, Chuck Long went on the radio, went on KCJJ radio two weeks ago and called it nepotism. So don't say I'm coming off too strong because this is Chuck Long who said this and he's, and, and he was polite about it, but it is, it is nepotism. Is it not? I mean, what, what else is the definition of nepotism anymore, Mark? This seems to be it here when there's not merit given to the, to justify a position. Erica, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate that. This is certainly something that uh, we discussed um, last week or the week before, but in regards to, yeah, the coach from Colorado State and his name one. John Budmeyer. Yeah. Yep. Um, going to be an intern, become the quarterback coach next year. Listen, he's not a – for all of us, I, you're not going to know what the, this illustration, Mark, is. you live out east. For all of us people who live in Iowa – He's not a 16-year-old at Fairway, okay? He's not working at the meat counter. This is a guy who just came off a, a – and I understand the question, Eric. I'm not insulting you, but this is a guy who just got done making, like, what, 325000 last year to be a coordinator. He, he doesn't need to work as an intern for a year to prove himself. And I, I don't understand – I just – maybe there's an explanation. I'm sure there's an explanation, but I, I just want to know what it is because – if Iowa did see him as the next offensive coordinator, like I've heard people say that there, you know, somebody on my show last night, well, is the master plan for Kirk to retire after this year, promote Brian as head coach and make John your offensive coordinator. Well, if that's the master plan, I mean, we got some, we, we, this is going to be a really tough couple of years to be an Iowa fan, but I don't think that is. But my point is, even if they did see him as the OC in a year or two, Mark, he could go somewhere else. And be a quarterbacks coach for a year or two, and then come here. Is it is familiarizing himself? Does that is that really worth, you know, taking a hundred hundreds of thousands of dollars off of his yearly paychecks? I mean, I just don't see that. That I don't think that's what's happening here, Erica. My guess is, and it still doesn't make total sense. But my my best case scenario, my best guess here, is that he is here because it's a stopgap. And he's here for a while until he gets an offer that he really wants. You know, he's got a family. He's, he's from Illinois. You know, he's um, he's nephew-in-law to former Iowa uh, stars Chuck Hartlieb and Jim Hartlieb. So there's a connection there to Iowa. Um, he worked for Paul Christ. Obviously, he was very Paul, close with Paul Christ because he worked with him at Pitt, worked with him at Wisconsin. And I know Kirk has a lot of respect for, for Paul Christ. So you can see the connections there. But who knows? I mean, it's his business. He wants to volunteer there. Um, that's his business. And I think it can help Iowa right, right now in, in the short term, but it doesn't take away from the uh, fact that he probably should be the guy coaching quarterbacks. If he's there on the field, he should be the quarterbacks coach. And, um, but you know, you never know. It's a, it's a glimmer of hope for fans who are concerned about that position. Thank you everyone, Erica. Thank you for the super chat and everyone else for being here, leaving your comments and questions and participating as always here on our 36th edition of Iowa Hawkeyes live here at the voice of college football. Corey's cranking out the content, uh, football, basketball, of course, uh, the pedal on uh, the football content. I would think now that basketball season's over on uh, from the Hawkeye of the storm and uh, join us uh, back here next week, everyone. I am headed over to talk some Huskers football, and I'm certain that we will have a 45-minute discussion on Nebraska's chances against the SEC 
East and West Division. Let me just uh, add one more thing, Mark, before yes. you go. Um, I know we didn't talk a lot about John Nestor, right? Yeah. The, the Iowa commit from yesterday. Excuse me. Real quickly, 6'1", 190 out of sh- the Chicago area, projected more as a safety. If you want to break down him, check out my channel. We'll, we'll produce these next few months. We're going to be hitting it hard with content. So, uh, But head over to my channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm and uh, check out that uh, that excerpt. Um, just my reaction, about a four or five minute video on John Nestor and his commitment. All right, Corey, thank you for making this uh, work each and every week. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mark.